Go ahead. Make my day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Towers. But please, don't hold that against me. Welcome to it, everyone. We'll see how today's show goes. I'm trying to reshuffle things. I'm trying to put my priorities in order. And you know what? Because I love you all so much, I am putting things back in their natural place. But I'm not going to make any promises today. I am just going... I'm going to let action speak louder than words, right? That's what we need to do. So hopefully moving forward, you'll be happy with the actions and uh, and won't have to worry about the words. Well, you can just judge me on those. Um... I'm a little bit on fire today. Uh, you know, I've. And this is a totally weird personal thing. I don't know why I share personal weird things with you guys. Um, because personally, maybe I am weird, which is entirely possible. Um, <clears throat> so I don't. I don't drink as much coffee as I used to. Great way to start a real estate show, right? Um, so what I've done, but I still find the need for the caffeine. Particularly, mainly because I don't like coffee, so I would drink it as a mocha. And I'm doing, I've on my list of things to do is to be, become less of a bulbous fat guy. So, so I, I fast two days a week. It's all working great, by the way. If you ever want to do intermittent fasting, I, I think it actually works. If I stick to the plan, it works. And I'm steadily losing like a handful of pounds every week. So yay, right? Progress that you can see. Um, but because I can't stand just straight coffee, and coffee is one of those things you can drink when you're fasting, I find myself petering out at the end of the day. And I've been doing this now for a while, and, I, and that's one reason why I come the end of the day, I'm kind of done, right? And it used to be I would come home, and no matter what time I got home, whether it was you know 5 p.m. or 10 p.m., I would sit down and I would crank out a show for the next day. For those of you who remember when I was doing shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Like clockwork. Uh, so now what I've started doing is, t- and some people are going to give me half. I, whenever I talk about stuff like this, I get, I don't know why you guys don't ask me real estate questions, but you ask me about weird stuff. The weird stuff seems to be stuff you like. So I take a caffeine pill and I just took one and I'm kind of a lightweight, right? I, I oftentimes wouldn't have coffee in the middle of the day because it just wires the hell out of me. So I popped a caffeine pill, which obviously is going to be more intense than just drinking coffee. I think, I think one caffeine pill has the coffee equivalent of two cups of coffee, which is more than I drink on your typical day. I took it about 30 minutes ago and I'm on fire. So, uh, and as I record this, this is normally the time of the day when I'm starting to feel wound down. So yay, the caffeine pill idea is working. Um, but now you guys have to live with me being heavy with caffeine. And frankly, you guys seem to like me more when I'm hopped up on caffeine. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, And today is a charged one. Today is one that's likely to really get me pissed off as we talk uh, because it's, it's one of those things. It is one of those things about this business that annoys the hell out of me. And it, and I, and it's, it's, it's something you need to be aware of for everything because it's, it's a technique that is used in every area where someone wants you to surrender your money. Right now, and, and I hate it. <laughs> I hate it with a passion. But I can see where it has its place if ethically implemented, right? Um, and, I, and I think we do it naturally. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not going to be coy. I mean, I've already named this show probably this. But it's how rapport can be your worst enemy. And I want to get into it a bit. I'm going to get into some specifics of why I'm suddenly thinking about this but then also cover why it annoys me and how you can defend yourself when when the establishing of rapport is being used against you uh, and, and pushing you towards making a decision that is based too much on that and not enough on what you're actually going to get out of thing, get out of the relationship you're going into. Now, of course, I'll be specific to real estate, but all of these people, 
See, I even hesitate to call them people because I don't I don't want to admit they're people because I don't want people to be like this. Uh, in in whether they're trying to sell you a car or the windows, the new windows to your house, or be your real estate agent, rapport is their greatest weapon. Um, and one reason why this has sort of come to the to the fore for me is uh, I tend to shun a lot of the real estate. You could, if this was a video format, you'd be able to see me doing my air quotes around my head. Uh, and and uh, who 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 say I'm gonna I'm the guy who can get you listings. You do what I do, and I'll get you all these listings. And, and these are actually these are the things that first got me annoyed with the world of real estate. Well, the very first office I worked at right after I got my license was a Century 21 office that no longer exists, uh, but it was in Mountain View. And my my welcome to the office thing was, here's all these tapes, tapes I want you to listen to. And it was basically a real estate seminar thing on how to, do, how to be a successful real estate agent. And of course, it encapsulated everything I despise or everything that is wrong with the real estate business because there wasn't a single thing in those tapes that talked about how to be actually good at the job you're being hired for. There was nothing about all the important things you need to do in helping a buyer find a house, how to negotiate a contract, how to make sure all the terms are are uh, executed effectively. N- just none of it, right? <laughs> and that's 99% of what you get when you, t- even today, when you go join an office. Now, I know I have tons of real estate agents out there. Um, and I want to reach out a little bit. I want to give a shout out anyway to a couple of folks out there who even remember the podcast I used to do called Being the Better Agent. <laughs> um, and I haven't, I still own the URL, but I haven't done, I did that podcast for like a year when I first started doing this podcast, just because I thought a podcast aimed specifically at agents might be a good thing. Um, but then I kind of rolled it into this show. So thank you, <laughs> whoever, uh, the person who emailed me, I could, there wasn't a name associated with it. It was one of those, it looked like an anonymous thing, but it was somebody who was listening all the way back when I did the, uh, be the better agent podcast. But anyway, okay. So, of course, this treads some familiar ground where I've talked about the things that annoy me and the, and the, and the things that are so absolutely wrong with the business where you, you don't, these aren't people who I think that a lot of these folks who get into real estate are not naturally black hat, mustache twirling, tie the, tie the, the person to the railroad tracks kind of folks, but they're trained to be that. And a level of normalcy is attached to casual lying, right? We talked, and that's something I've talked about before, if you've been a listener for a while, but let me lay it out for you. So I, I, I I surrendered to my, my, my burning interest in, well, what are these guys teaching? So I went ahead and signed up for one of these really well-known, I'm not going to give the guy's name out. There's a line I think I have to draw because this, this isn't unique to this guy, right? This, this is what everybody's preaching. So by calling this individual out, I, I, I think it would be unfair. Now, I'm, I'm kind of in this weird mode where I want to do a survey of all these various people who do this kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's the ones that are complete hacks that, I have, that I'm going to avoid. And you can, you can pretty much tell who those are. If you Google you know, the guy's name or the gal's name and reviews or anything like that, you can kind of get a feel for whether or not they're hitting the mark. Um, and then I, I want to tease out of it strategies and techniques that work, but that don't violate my personal sense of ethics. Um, and I, and I, my goal here is in sharing this is to do a couple of things. One, to arm all you buyers, sellers, and investors with an understanding that these tools are being used directly against you, particularly sellers. Uh, mo- almost everyone out there who's pushing trainings for real estate agents is talking about getting you listings because listings are gold and it's, you know, the whole yada yada that goes on with that. I'm sure all, all of you who are real estate agents out there know when you're getting solicited via email and via every other means for you to spend money on a training, it's about how to get you more listings. But this is also going out to my real estate agents. And by, by for the love of God, please engage some level of ethics whenever you're taking these trainings, because I know for a fact, 
<laughs> that some of these trainings are being bought by really big name offices and being handed out or, or electronically provided so that you use these techniques. And I swear to God, it, it is so damn annoying uh, to sit through them. So I, I have sat through two so far from two different people, both of them with the same vibe. And, and the key, the, the cherry in, at the top, the, the whole key, the chewy center was building rapport and about doing X, Y, and Z in a way to, so that it's a pre, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that these folks will list with you. And they talk about everything from the first moment you contact them to what you do when you walk in the door and the conversations you have and how you establish dominance and all of these things. And, and. I don't disagree with all of it. And you know what? Sometimes in in as a real estate agent, you need to figure out what your place in the relationship with your client needs to be. Obviously, the fundamental base level thing that you that you as a buyer, seller, and investor should expect from an agent and you as an agent should demand of yourself is you know, effectively representing your client's needs even when they are at, at odds with your needs. You may need to close an escrow in 30 days or you're in trouble. Well, don't put that need above the need of your clients. And I know I'm asking a lot. That may mean going deeper in debt on your credit card or whatever. But I swear to God, if you if you keep the needs of your clients forefront in your mind and honestly put them above your own needs, that is going to pay off. Are they going to pay off today? No. Will they pay off over time? Yeah. A, because you're living your life in a way, you're executing your duties in a way that in a indelible way will permeate what you do as a real estate person, uh, even ways you don't even realize, right? Because you're, you're, why? You're not embracing the casual lie. So let's jump into it for a second. What are some of the casual lies? And remember, these are common to all of the things that agents are being taught. Um, in establishing rapport, um, you're likely to be shocked at all the things that are included in the establishing rapport equation. Now, establishing rapport, as I said, isn't a bad thing, but it's a, it's, it's being used as a tool of manipulation and, 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 you know, maybe you, maybe you could consider any interaction with another human being where you're trying to put your best foot forward, a manipulation. But the problem I have is when things cross over into orchestrated deceptions that seem like little white lie deceptions that add up. And, and again, anytime you embrace something that is false, you're setting the stage for future willingness to embrace things that are false. Once you embrace the little false thing, the next thing that's false, that's bigger is easier to embrace. So that's why I have a problem with it. Now we're going to go ahead and cover these. I'm going to, I'm going to start at the beginning and work my way through, um, And we'll talk about what what is what what are scenarios where this actually makes sense to do. We'll we'll talk about that too. Pretty rare circumstances, but also one where that should be handled openly. We'll we'll talk about that. But first, we're gonna take a quick break. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we spent the first half of the show just kind of laying it out, right? Uh, rapport is being used as a weapon against you. Uh, for those of you who are real estate agents that are out there listing a ton of stuff, um, you're, you may be doing this, and you may be doing it in a way that annoys me greatly. And you'll say, but hey, it works. I'm getting 100 listings a month. Great. Um, 
I have a whole host of problems with that statement. <laughs> uh, there is no way that you are delivering the level of service that a client deserves if you're doing 100 listings a month. You're just not. You're just not. Uh, is that great for you in terms of the amount of income you're generating? Absolutely. Are, are you likely to completely ignore everything I'm about to say because what you're doing is generating so much money for you? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just the way it is. Uh, but be honest with yourself. At the level of service you're offering is absolutely replaceable by automation, right? You're just pushing things through. And at getting that many listings per month, the odds are you're barely doing anything relating to the transaction once it actually gets, gets into escrow. And you're likely barely doing anything while it's listed. You're posting it to the MLS and that's it. Uh, there's no specialty marketing that, that, that is aimed specifically at promoting that property. Uh, you may have stuff that you think you do that's specialized, but it's only specialized for your listings. Maybe anyway, you're, you, there's, you can't make that argument to me, right? A hundred listings a month. That's 1200 listings a year. <laughs> and then you also become one of those folks who may be getting a ton of listings, but whatever the canceled or 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 uh expired listing rate is in your area you probably have the one of the worst numbers when considered in your marketplace you probably have more people canceling and more people expiring in terms of their listings with you than anyone else because you're not delivering anything close to any personalized service or any uh, any service that goes beyond the minimum right um because that's just kind of the way it works. And, and the data I see when I look at specific agents who are doing a huge amount of business, uh, that's what I tend to see. You can say, well, only I only lose two, only 2% 2 of my properties don't close. Well, you know what? That in your area, I'm willing to bet that number should be more like 1% or 0.05%, right? I'm just saying that, that in the market you're in, you're probably doing worse on those numbers than everyone else. But, in, and again, to take your position, you don't care <laughs> because that represents such a small portion of your overall and you're still cranking out the cash. What I'm suggesting here is that if that if we apply a little more ethics to what we do, we are going to establish better relationships with our clients. And while it may not feel as rewarding financially today, you're going to get more clients referring you. You're, you're going to be the nothing special agent. You're going to be the agent whose name isn't remembered. And you know what? For a lot of clients I've had over the last 10 years, I'm not even remembered. I had one list their house just the, just what was about four months ago who I was pals with. So even my theory doesn't work all the time. Uh, but they ended up listing and selling with someone else, not because they consciously decided to. They just, it just happened. I, I did not stay front of mind enough with them. So clearly I need to learn the lesson of staying in touch with my past clients more. I only reach out usually like, once they get, once it gets to a certain point, I only reach out like once a year, right? They'll get like a Christmas card and that kind of thing from me. But anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so I get that there's going to be plenty of folks saying, well, yeah, well, Robert can say whatever he likes. I'm driving my, uh, my high-end Mercedes and, and I own, you know, a $4 million house. So screw you. Totally get it. Totally understand the mindset. Carry on. No need for you to listen to me anymore. Unless... You're realizing you're lying a lot more than you should be, and you'd like to stop. All right. So uh, it starts before you even meet them. Let's say uh, that you are looking to sell your home, and you come across an ad uh, that, that hits it just right. And this part I don't have a problem with, right? So, And, and this is about writing headlines of advertisements that that zero right in on the concerns of sellers. And that could be different in different marketplaces. It could, in my marketplace, it might be uh, you want to hit that hot button of, hey, before the market drops, let's get your home on the market and get you into something better. It could be, we've talked about this before on the show, sellers that are afraid of selling because they're afraid of finding, not finding a home that's appropriate for them to move to. So address that, have a headline that says, you know, guaranteed no risk listing. If you don't find the house of your dreams, your, your sale is canceled, right? There, there's another headline. So it starts there, but that's acceptable, right? That's simply targeting the concerns of folks out there in the marketplace that are sellers. Okay. 
Next, let's say that you get that listing appointment. So before you've even met this person, uh, they have done, they've either because of experience or whatever, know the, the, uh, typical makeup of the neighborhood in which you live. Is it blue collar? Does it tend to be folks who are a little bit on the on the lower income side, the higher income side? And they're going to dress the part. They are going to to wear an outfit that fits with you. Oh, and this is this is very much going to be a theme throughout this whole rapport as your enemy thing. They're going to try to dress like you, sound like you, act like you, the whole nine yards, right? They're they're <laughs> They're going to let you establish conversationally how they're going to marry you. Let's say you're someone who's a little bit loose with the language in terms of uh, profanity. So they're going to come in neutral and they're going to, if you use profanity, they're going to use profanity. If you have a little bit of an accent, they're going to try to introduce a little bit of that accent into how they talk. Uh, They're going to mirror what you say. If you cross your legs, they're going to cross their legs. If you lean on with your elbow and and touch your face, they're going to do the same thing. So it's all going to start right there in all of these subtle ways. And I mention this because I want you to be aware of it. And I want you to be consciously thinking to yourself, none of what this person is doing is necessarily bad, right? It's establishing reports, starting to increase your comfort level. But what I want you to be aware of is that none of these things should be affecting your decision. Now, here is what is most interesting about rapport. Rapport becomes the subconscious motivator that makes you pick the person who is establishing it with you. So you're not even going to have a rational reason, right? You're going to look at yourself and think to yourself, you know, I just feel good about this guy or I feel good about this girl, right? That's, that is the level on which you're being hit with the establishing of rapport. So, but it gets worse. And now everything so far, I don't, technically have a problem with. I mean, maybe changing the way I'm dressing based on who I'm going to visit. Uh, you know, uh, they even talk about, you know, not being flashy for those for those middle of the road homes. Don't show up in your Ferrari or whatever for those homes. Show up in your in your Honda instead, um, which is creepy as creepy as hell, frankly. Uh, but but even at that level, we're kind of still straddling the fence, right? You're simply trying to <clears throat> be a part of the milieu of that particular seller. And so remember, a huge part of this is going to be mirroring, <clears throat> which you, some of you may have learned it, right? It's, it's, it's not a technique unique to real estate. Uh, re, uh, car salesmen use them uh, in leadership trainings in major corporations. This is used when you're when you're talking with uh, folks on your team or negotiating with other folks within your organization or talking with external people. These are all things that folks are taught to do to build rapport. So I think we're still on okay ground, right? It's it's when we start to kind of move into the areas where now through observation. Real estate agents are trained to identify all of the signs or all of the indicators of you. Do based on everything they're seeing, uh, do you have a political sign in your front yard? Do you have any political stuff on your car? Do you have any not political stuff? Maybe something else. Maybe uh, uh, something that shows you're into volleyball or whatever else. Um, as as they're walking up to the home, right? Um, may, and they've done they've done a quick Google on you right? They now know your name. They know where you live. By doing a quick Google, they may discover that you're a member of a Harley Davidson forum. Um, You know, all kinds of things that folks can find out. Anything else, college references, uh, workplace references, et cetera, all these kinds of things. These folks are being taught to pay attention to all of this. Now, here's the part where I suddenly get a problem with it. Now, and as soon as they walk into your home, they're look, doing the same thing. They're looking at your home for keys to your heart. Um, gather these keys and use them to open all of the doors that prevent you from, that, that might prevent you from listing with this agent. And here's the part that gets me. You're supposed to make it up. You're supposed to pretend. You're supposed to lie. Let's say you discover that somebody is really into volleyball. Uh, through there, let's say there's a, there's a 
sticker for volleyball on the car. You go into the house, you can see photos of family members playing volleyball, or maybe it's rugby, who knows, whatever. You're just supposed to act like you're all into rugby. You're all into, you're all into whatever it is they're into, even if you couldn't care less. Um, and I can't pull this off because I, I, I wouldn't, if just because I may not remember, how do you, how do you keep these? If you're meeting a hundred people a month, how do you keep these lies straight in your head? How do you keep straight in your head that on, and remember we're talking about, there's only 30 days in a month. So we're talking about three plus listing appointments a day, assuming they're doing it every day, right? Right. That makes sense. How do you keep it, keep track of it? Let's say you show a certain level of enthusiasm for that volleyball in that first meeting and you get the listing and then you're having a phone call with this person and, you know, they, they start asking you something that doesn't give you an idea of the specific sport they're talking about, but is asking you, say, what did you think of this? Of course, you're going to start lying and saying, oh, I thought it was great. You know, I was really into it. it I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, that kind of stuff would annoy the hell out of me. It's just too much work to lie to that many people in a month, much less a year. Uh, but you need to be aware of this stuff because as this relate, as this conversation between you and this agent moves through, when they're going to close you, when they're asking for the signature, they're not going to say, stuff they're they're going to they're going to keep it on this personal level because that's where they want it to be. They need this decision for you to list with them to be an emotional one. Right? And these folks are likely to come in and what's likely to happen is your listing appointment with them is going to be very lopsided towards emotional personal stuff and light on all the other stuff. It's going to be light on a lot of real estate information. But this works. The reason why they do it is it works. So my goal here is for you to be pre-armed. Is every agent who comes in for you going to be doing this? To some degree, yes. Right? Um, I think just conversationally, I do it. I think, but I think it just happens. I, I, when I'm at a table with someone, I tend to... Um, start to mirror them. I catch myself doing it, right? Where they lean back, I lean back. When they lean forward, I lean forward. When they put their elbows on the table, I put my elbows on the table. And I I don't see myself doing that consciously, but I I, I get that I'm doing it, right? You're, you're, You're getting into common ground with your folks. Now, I don't have any problem with building rapport. I'm not suggesting that rapport is bad. I think rapport is really good, but I think honest rapport is where people need to go. Uh, You need to reject this idea that you lie. If they're totally into football and you hate football, don't tell them you like football. Don't tell them it's great. If you've got a good story to tell about football, fantastic. If one of your kids is into football, fantastic. Share that with them. Um, Just because it, it doesn't, you don't need to tell someone you love something in order to build rapport with them. You can talk about experiences relating to it that don't have anything to do with you loving it or hating it, but that just share some things that you've experienced. Okay. Point here is, is there's going to be a big push for your conversations to be about mutual affinities, things that you share, affinities between you and the other person that are common, even if you make it up, even if it's a lie. And I don't, and I have a problem like that. Um, And they're going to get trained in, in not only finding rapport with you, but if there's another decision maker in the process, if, if, if there's two people who need to agree that this listing is going to happen and you need two signatures on the listing agreement, your first clue that this, that someone is really bringing out the big guns on building rapport is they are, they are going to pick something that builds rapport with both of you. It won't be, let's say that clearly the husband is into football and the wife couldn't stand football. They're not going to pick football as that conversational rapport builder. They're going to pick something they've tried to figure out. That's about that involves both of you that draws both of you in. So just be aware of it. And the reason I'm saying these things is I want you to be aware of it, not necessarily as a rejection of the person in front of you. This is a common thing. This is what they do. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's something I'm suggesting that we use as something to absolutely discount someone, but I want you to be aware of it because it's absolutely going to be used against you. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, what do you do about it? Well, You establish ahead of time what the criteria is that you need from an agent that you believe is going to do the best job for you. Now, I put forward that 
you should never hire an agent because they close 1,200 escrows a year or that they list 100 homes a month. That is it. I consider that stupid. Um, it's great for the agent and it's great for the agent's broker. It is not good for you. It would be, if you have 100 homes to sell, great. But what you should stick with, stick to your guns on the data that we've talked about. Being a top producing agent should mean nothing to you. Selling the most homes last year should mean nothing to you. They don't have any influence because what you want is your home sell, sold in the best possible way. Now, how do we define best? We focus on your needs, right? You agents out there, pay attention to this because let me tell you something. A lot of these guys out there selling these uh, programs that really get your listing, get, get you closing the listings, that get you with a signature on the listing. There is one number they tend to throw out there that uh, in terms of how many listings they get, how many appointments they end up closing. I beat those guys a lot. Uh I have out of the last, I, I probably, if we had to use a, a, a round number, I'd say 90% of the time I get the listing, but I would, I think if we went back even further and got the, and just got more and more of a sample going back over more than a couple of years, it would be more, it would be a lot closer to 95 or maybe even a hundred percent. The number of times I haven't listed the home when I've gone on a listing appointment, I can only remember one time that's happened in the last, I don't know, 10 years. I mean, and I go on a lot of listing appointments and sometimes I get the listing for another agent, right? Remember, I've got agents that I'm associated with. So a lot of times I'm in there pitching for, for a listing that, that where I'm assisting another agent. But anyway, if you focus on what I'm talking about, you can still build rapport, just build it honestly, but then focus on the numbers that actually mean something to sellers. We've talked about this before. They are, of all the homes you listed, how many have you sold? Now, in some of these programs I've listened to, the, the answer to that is supposed to be, if you're a brand new agent, you've never sold a home, you're supposed to say something cute, like, I've sold every home I've listed, because I've listed zero homes, right, if you're brand spanking new. Uh, but anyway, uh, just, you know, find out, do, do a little questioning, and ask them, how many homes that you listed have you sold? How many homes did you list last year? And of the homes you listed... How many actually sold? What percentage of the homes you listed last year sold, right? Um, because that's a super interesting number. If you knew that you only had a 50% chance of the home you list with an agent selling, what would you think? Not real good, right? If you've got a 50-50 chance in a market where more like 70 to 80% or 90% of the homes that listed get sold, that's a number you ought to know, right? That matters to you. I don't know a single agent other than myself who even makes themselves aware of that number, right? The other thing, and and you want that to be something that's re- relative to your local marketplace, right? If If 95% of homes that list sell within 30 days in your marketplace and you're talking to an agent who only closes or gets sold 60% of their homes, well, that's not even the average for the, for the area. Why is that happening? You'd want to know. You'd want to ask that question. That's a deer in the headlights moment. They're not going to, they're not going to have an answer to that question. Next is what's the average days on market. Now, the way I track my sales I have to, I track these two things very exactly because it's a moving target, right? A lot of I've had agents try to call me on the carpet and say, "Well, how can you even calculate that?" Well, it's easy. When you go into the listing appointment and you give them the the competitive market analysis, you tell them two things that are super important, right? That you can simply write down in a spreadsheet and use later. One of those numbers is the average days on market for a similar home in that market, right? Let's say it's 30 days. You write that number down. The other number is the average price for a home, the average sales price for a home in that market. And then you do an intelligent analysis of their home to determine whether it's worth more than the average or less than the average, or maybe the market's changed and some of that debt it came out and it's a softer market. So maybe you need to be priced a little lower, but you that's another number you write down. This is the number I believe. This is what your home should list for. Now, you may end up listing it higher because that's what they want to do. You, who knows? There's a variety of things that could be involved. But so you've got a number you can pick to sell at, and you've got a number you can pick for how long it should take you to sell at that number, 
And you can decide at that point, and you need to advise your client whether or not that sales number is unrealistic if they're listing it too high. Um, you need to be honest about that, right? But then in my particular business, and I keep track of all those numbers, right? So I then write, and then when everything's over in the same spreadsheet, I write down, here's what I sold it for. And here's how many days it took me to sell it. And I make a pledge to my clients that I will beat the average for the marketplace. So if the average days on market is 30, if it takes me 31 days or more to get your home sold, I owe you money. If I listed your home at X amount of dollars and on average in that marketplace, homes were selling 2% below asking price or 2% above asking price, if I don't get you that number, I pay you again. So in, in this example, let's say it was a $100,000 house. We, we did all the numbers and we figured it out. And let's say on average in that marketplace, homes were selling for 2% above asking price, which would be $102,000. If I don't beat that, if I don't beat what the market is, in other words, I need to get you more than 2% over asking price, then I pay you again. So the, what I'm telling you is, as your agent, I'm guaranteeing to you that I will beat whatever the average is in those marketplaces, or I will pay you money for failing to do so, right? And those are the only two things as a seller that sh those should be at the top of your need list. Now, granted, every seller is a little bit different. Some folks are very averse to stress. Some people have other needs. Some people may need to, to sell much, much quicker. So maybe that means you have to be more aggressive on the list price, make it lower. The point, and that, and that, but, but we're trying to talk about broad strokes here. So you as a buyer, seller, and investor, when you feel like rapport is being emphasized in your listing appointment, that's all fine. Build rapport, get to know the person. If you want to be a jerk about it or, or an awesome person, <laughs> Uh, when, when you get the feeling you're being reported to the point where this person's lying to you, start asking questions. Only someone who is sincere in their interest in your hobbies would know the answer to, right? I think that'd be funny. Some people wouldn't. Some people don't enjoy confrontation. I would lap that up like sweet, sweet sugar. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, let me suggest that you, no matter how much rapport they beat you over the head with, Make sure that you establish the, the criteria that is what's of most interest to you as a seller. And we just talked about it. All right. And you as real estate agents. So let's, let's arm real estate agents. Come on, be less of a jerk. Can we do that? And it's not your fault. Here's the deal. You are the victim of programming that is poor. You are a victim of programming that is strictly results oriented where the results don't match with the needs of your clients. Right. And this this is not, again, a screed against a specific trainer. This is this is a philosophy that permeates the business. It is a conversation that is had between you and your broker. The very first day you're thinking about joining the brokerage it is it is information that's try people try to pour into your head in every single training you're going to get. That training could come from your office. That training could come from the Association of Realtors office in your area. It could come from the seminar you're going to from the National Association in terms of folks standing on a stage and telling you how to how to do things in business. None of them are telling you how to be a good real estate agent. They're telling you how to simply get signatures on listing agreements, and that is it, right? And maybe how to get signatures on contracts. That's not enough. If you want to not be replaced by automation sometime in the next five to 10 years, you have to be better. You have to be the value-add agent. And honestly, these folks who do it this other way are not value-add agents. The sad thing is, I say this, but in the back of my head, I realize, you know what? No one's going to even realize it. <laughs> We're still going to have these folks uh, that do things this way. And, and to one degree or another, they're going to beat out everyone else because they're simply going to be marketing so much more aggressively than everyone else. But, but for God's sake, at, at least if you can just take it to a honest level, let's just keep things honest. How about that? We won't lie. We won't make things up. We won't pretend to like things we don't. We'll just be honest. Isn't that an amazing innovation in the world of real estate and, and used car sales and in, you know, selling whatever it is you're selling. Let's try to do it that way. Uh, cause I think you can, and I think you can do it and still be very successful. In fact, I think it can be a, a incredible part of a very successful strategy. So hopefully that helps folks. And I, I'm really looking forward to hearing stories from those of you who have taken this to heart and you have felt the giant 
barbed wire wrapped bat <laughs> of rapport being used on you and you've called it out and you've made them focus on the criteria you care about. Don't let them, don't let the agent who comes in define the criteria under which they work for you. They can. I mean, uh, that's that's great. But make sure they're meeting your minimum requirements for what you should expect from your agent. There's absolutely no reason uh, why that's an unreasonable expectation on your part. In fact, you know, I'm always someone who believes that an agent who do, does, and of course I believe this because it's what I do, right? Uh, my bias is I, I do what I believe is the best. So you're not going to get a good argument from me to support these other guys' attitude. But I believe that's how I earn my money, right? And we talked about percentages a while ago, right? Making you beating the average. That's how I earn my my commission. Uh, and and the vast majority of the time, the amount I beat the average in the market more than equals the commission that I'm being paid. So I bring more value than I take out of the transaction. And I want that to be the I want that to be the goal of every agent, and I want that to be the expectation of every every buyer, seller, and investor. Can we do that? Can we change the world together, people? Next on a very special Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. We're not going to go there. Sorry. All right. Thanks again, everybody. We've gone a little long today. I truly appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say on these subjects. I hope it is helpful. Get out there. Make good things happen. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you all next time.